whilst we on one prepare to blast off into the sky at night. I'm in Helsinki on my way to Moscow. Nothing very remarkable in that. But I'm going to join a most unusual group of travellers. We're going down to a remote part of the Soviet Union, not very far from the border with Afghanistan. We're going to a Baikonur, Russia's main rocket launching ground. Way back in October 1957, six months after the sky at night started, the Russians launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite. And that made a great difference to Russian astronomy because there's so much astronomy that can be done only from space, and the Russians have always been very good astronomers. Baikonur is easily the most important rocket complex in the whole of the Soviet Union. I've never been there, and frankly, I'm looking forward to it. It's very seldom being filmed. Why were some of my fellow travelers keen to come on this trip? Well, I've, I've always been interested in uh, space travel and I've been to Cape Canaveral and uh, Houston and I wanted to be able to compare the Russian way of doing things with the American way and, and see, see how the two, two sites differ. Well I'm particularly interested in going down to the Baikonur Cosmodrome of Tyruratam and seeing the launch hopefully of the, uh, the Progress cargo vehicle that's going up to the Mir space station and also seeing the Soviet shuttle about which one has heard so much seeing it actually first hand and of course Energia, which is currently the most powerful rocket launcher in the world, and just seeing what that's like. And of course that really is in some ways the future of the Soviet space program, seeing how that will build in the years to come into how their space program develops with shuttle flights servicing the station and even construction of vehicles that will one day go to Mars. Uh, it, it, in the middle of the, the desert it's uh, very small and complex, but to actually see it in in real life, and also where Gagarin started off the whole space, the manned space project, um, it's absolutely fascinating. There are no passenger flights to Baikonur, so the Soviet military agreed to fly us down in one of their none too modern planes. The flight takes about three and a half hours from Moscow. Baikonur is in Kazakhstan, near the Sea of Aral one of the most sparsely populated areas of the Soviet Union. But of course, in here, it's rather noisy, and I can't see out of the window, so um, I'll tell you more about it when we get there. Looking round here in Baikonur, the snowy scene is very different indeed from Cape Canaveral. But this is one of the most important of all the launching sites. It's the launch pad at the Proton site, and from here, in 1986, the Russians sent up Mir, the first permanent manned space station. And later, they sent up the astrophysical module Kavant, which was attached to it. And quite separately, from here too, up went the Phobos probes to Mars, the Vega probe, which bypassed Halley's Comet, and many others. But the largest launch site at Baikonur is for Energia. Now, Energia is the Soviet rocket which is far more powerful than any other, and the only one which is capable of launching their space shuttle, Buran, or Snowstorm. It really is extremely impressive. There have so far been two Energia launches, and the first one ended in the, well, more or less destruction of the launching complex, simply because of the vibration was so much more than they expected. So this new complex, the present Energia launching pad, is very much more massive. The rocket sits between these two huge launching towers, and just in case anything goes wrong, there's an evacuation tube down which the cosmonauts can escape quickly. Now we're in the Energia building, where the Energias and Berans are assembled. In one section, there's the massive central part of the Energia, the world's most powerful rocket, which, when it's fully completed, will lift a maximum payload of 200 tons. And even with the four strap-on boosters that are now being planned and used, it'll lift 100 tons. And this also is a very interesting building historically from the astronomical point of view because we now know that the Russians did in fact plan to send a man to the moon in the 1960s. And this was the building which was designed for their lunar shot. 
But in fact, that didn't work. There were too many failures. They called it off. And in 1974, six years after it had been put up, they had transformed this building into the present Energia Buran complex. Buran, atop Energia, first flew in 1988. And here, being prepared for its next flight, and therefore surrounded by scaffolding, is Buran itself. Essentially similar in design to the American shuttle, though obviously with differences in detail. Its huge cargo bay can carry 30 tons of payload into orbit and can bring 20 tons of payload down. To give you some idea of the scale, its wingspan is almost 80 feet. The underside of Buran, as with the shuttle, is covered with black tiles to protect the spacecraft against the intense heat of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. But this is the real business of Baconer. We are just waiting for a launch. We're going to see an unmanned progress probe sent up to join the space station Mir, taking four tons of supplies. Mir has been in orbit around the Earth ever since 1986. It's a three-stage arrangement with four strap-on boosters. After two minutes, the boosters will fall away, and after just over nine minutes, the progress will be in orbit, ready to link up with Mir. It's all tremendously exciting. And as predicted, two minutes after liftoff, the boosters separated. So now the Progress rocket is on its way to link up with the Mir space station. But in fact, we heard later that it had some difficulty, although after a couple of attempts, the docking was successful. Dr. John Mason was one of the party looking round Baconer. I think the first thing that's impressed me is the sheer size of the complex here. Cape Kennedy in the US is large, but Baikonur Cosgrove really is enormous. It covers an area of over a thousand square kilometres, and you have to drive for perhaps 50 kilometres to get from one side to the other. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that there are many different launch complexes here. There is the large inertia pads, they are massive heavy lift rocket, there's the proton booster for smaller payloads, and there is the Soyuz, the real workhorses of the Soviet programme. And although, of course, there may well be budgetary cuts, indeed, they're talking at the moment of funding difficulties, and the Soviets are very open about that. It all looks in a very healthy state. There are launches up and coming and planned, and everyone seems very enthusiastic. And I think the final thing that's impressed me is the openness with which we've been shown so many interesting facilities here. For example, when we visited the Inertia complex where they're assembling the enormous heavy lift rocket Inertia and the strap-on boosters, we saw all of the boosters, we saw two giant Inertia rockets, and we also saw Inertia M, which is the cargo carrying variant of Inertia, which to my knowledge has never been openly admitted before. And we also saw the second shuttle, Buran 2, in its bay being checked out. And there was no uh, hint of anything to, to hide these things, and, and we were shown these things with great interest and enthusiasm by all concerned. John, you've made a close study of Russian space science. Why was Baikonur chosen? Baikonur was chosen in the early 1950s when the Soviets were looking around for a suitable site for their large manned space complex. And they picked Baikonur in Kazakhstan here, in the southern part of the USSR, because if you are going to launch rockets from the Earth, which of course is spinning, then the nearer you can sight the uh, base to the equator, the better it is, because you get the advantage of the Earth's rotation when you launch towards the east. That's one reason. The second was that they have over 300 sunny days a year here, so the weather is generally very good, although of course in the winter it's bitterly cold, and in the summer it's extremely hot. And also, they wanted a place which was very sparsely populated, which would mean that if any pieces of rocket debris came down, they wouldn't fall on a populated area. How did it get started? 
Well, it started in about 1955, when in this barren area of the Russian steppes, the first workers came and started to construct the first launch pads and the facilities for all the workers. And in two and a half years, they built the site. And of course, Sputnik 1 was launched from Baikonur on October the 4th, 1957. And that's, of course, when the space age began. Baikonur is the culmination of many years of work by the space planners and the cosmonauts. In America, the astronauts are trained in various places. But in the Soviet Union, the training is done mainly in one place, the aptly named Star City near Moscow. This is a full-scale model of the Mir space station. And here we have Kvant-1, launched in 1987, and that was Russia's first major space astronomic observatory. On the far side of Mir is Kvant-2, added in 1989. The third module is the crystal, and Buran will be attached to that in the near future. So in fact, these are the main Russian space astronomical observatories at the present time. And it was to work in the Mir space station that the first Britain in space, Helen Sharman, was sent. She and two Soviet cosmonauts were launched from Baikonur. Over the years, we've heard a great deal about Russian space successes, from Sputnik to Yuri Gagarin's remarkable flight, making him the first man in space. In fact, we've heard so much that sometimes we tend to forget that Russian astronomy is also tremendously strong. Of course, many of the important conferences are held here at Moscow State University. And to tell us more about Russian astronomy and space research, who better than Professor Boyachuk? Professor Alexander Boyachuk is president of the Astronomical Council and director of the Institute of Astronomy of the Academy of Sciences. Now we develop a new uh, generation of spacecraft. It has a gyro system. This is a jet system for stabilization in the previous satellite. And uh, we develop a special astrophysical program, which uh, include three different uh, type of uh, experiment. One of these experiment, it is ultraviolet experiment. We put very, not very big, but big enough telescope, uh, 1.7 meter telescope. That's quite big. Yes, but. <laughs> for space telescope, but not for on ground base. A 1.7 meter telescope, it will be second after Hubble telescope. And um, this telescope uh, we will use for spectroscopic work and uh, the same for direct image of star in the same, posi the same way as a Hubble telescope. But we have several telescopes which uh, permit us to investigate shorter wavelengths. Then we have a smaller telescope, 20 centimeter, with multi-level coating, which permit us to observe stars around 300, 200, 100 angstroms. And the uh, third experiment, it will be a radio experiment. And the spacecraft, which uh, radio antenna and 10 meter di diameter. And they will be work like a interferometer, long, very long base interferometer. One is uh, many telescopes will be located in the ground and one away in the space. It, is, it will be a di distance around 10 uh, diameters. It will uh, us uh, 10 times more resolution than it was before. All these three experiments will be, uh, now will be we develop now in international collaboration because it many reasons for this. First, uh, this reason is it is very, uh, very high cost <laughs> <laughs> for this, <laughs> very expensive, uh, this experiment. When is the first spectrum to be launched? Uh, we are planned to, for first plan, we uh, schedule was uh, first launch in 1993, X-ray and radio. I'm very interested in what we normally call the background radiation, and I think here is generally called the relic radiation, the weak radiation coming in from all sides, which may possibly be the remnant of the Big Bang. Yes. Uh, we, several years ago, we uh, realized an uh, experiment which called relic 
they give us upper limit for unhomogeneity of this background radiation. Lack of smoothness. Yes. And uh, now we are going to launch Relict 2, we called 92. It is will be first astrophysical experiment in future, 92. Uh, this uh, sensitivity will be roughly 10 times more than Relict 1. It give us more, if, if uh, upper, limi uh, upper limit is more deeply <laughs> than we have now, or maybe we discover some uh, homogeneity. It is very important for cosmology, for Big Bang theory, for uh, galactic theory of galactic formation, for many things. What about the plans for sending further probes to Mars? Uh, we are planned to 94 launch uh, special satellite, international satellite uh, for investigation. Um, it is a so very, very complicated uh, uh, experiment. There is a three part. One part, it is a orbital model. Yeah. Uh, they connected many things. Another part that they put in the Mars atmosphere, special balloon. And the third part that they put on the Mars surface many small stations which will investigate soil and give transmit temperature pressure and for a long time it, it will be mars 94 then in future we will be put some small jeep on the mars surface then the next step it will be pick up ground and go back on the earth <laughs> Sample and return, and, yes. as you did with the moon. Yes, and uh, at the end, people dream to put to send uh, some people uh, cosmonaut on the Mars and go back. <laughs> but it is so far from now. Would you like to guess as to when the first men will reach Mars? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I cannot guess because it is it is uh, our dream. I I am not uh, really sure it will be realize uh, because it's very expensive. Would you say then that um, astronomy and space research are yes. now very close together? Yes. Uh, we are in our country, we ju just now we did not con consider astronomy and space research as a separate branch of, uh, of science. We consider astronomy and we decide uh, science divided not by method or investigation. Science divided for by object of investigation. If I uh, start, I will, I'm going to study some galaxy. I, 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 I'm galaxy man. I take uh, data from space, from radio, from optical observation infrared observation for many things. I combined all this data and built my model of this galaxy. And we consider. I know in some country we have astronomy, solar physicists, uh, space research, and so on. But we, in our country, we consider astronomy altogether. One science, not divided. The Russians have come a long way since 1957, when they launched the first space satellite, Sputnik 1. But of course, we've got to remember that ultimately, everything depends upon politics and finance. And so far as the USSR is concerned, all the decisions are made here, in the Kremlin, in Moscow's Red Square. And let's hope that these decisions make it possible to go on into space and to Mars.